we live in a self-centered culture, selfies, me mentality, uh, but Jesus offers radical love. We want to invite you today to the Gary Wilson podcast and help us explore this idea of what radical love can do to a world that is in need, that is isolated, that is hurt, that is lonely, the radical love of Jesus. Joshua West is with me today, and we're continuing our series here. The series, if you would uh, catch our first episode, I'd love for you to go back and watch that as well as we talked about humility, the importance of that. But what we're talking about is 12 or so different aspects of what a revival in our generation would look like and what uh, this generation is hungry for. They, they want something real. And I would say this is one of the key elements here. A generation that is so absorbed in self is is ready for some radical love, the, the love of Jesus. Yeah, I would I would completely agree. I think I think it's so important today too, you know, to define <clears throat> what love is because, you know, I think the world has one one, you know, sort of version or definition of it. And then I think even in the church sometimes we have a a sort of superficial version of it but you know obviously the bible would say that god is love and so we need mm. to look at who god is and especially in the person of jesus christ yeah. how he related with people full of grace full of truth and so yeah radical love i i, I just love the word radical you know it's, yeah. it's like not regular love not i mean it's yeah. it, and i think it's it's pure love i think for us it seems radical yeah. Especially when it's in the backdrop of of a world where inside we are always biting for our place for mm-hmm. ourselves, and so yeah, I'm really true. excited to talk about this. Yeah, you have um, you're on onto something good there. How do you define love in a generation that uh, uses the word love for uh, I, I love my laptop, uh, I love my dog, <laughs> I love pizza, I love my wife, I love God, uh, you know. Uh, the English does a disservice to this word. That's why you have to almost attach a word like radical, right? Uh, because, but the but the Greek actually expands this. It shows, you know, the, the, it's, and probably most of you listening already know this. You know, the three different words: the eros, the phileo, and then the agape love. And there's actually four, but okay. but the three that get used in the Bible okay. is the those three. I was what's the trying, fourth one? Trying to correct you all now off the top remember? of my head, okay. I can't even think of it. But okay. there are there are four Greek words for okay. it. But um, yeah. So I brought it up, and now now yeah, I look yeah, forward. See, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of a, it's, a, it's, the, it's, it's the humbling of last week's episode. <laughs> Praise God! Thank you for humbling me, Lord. <laughs> yeah. No, but you know, if 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 you would, you know, so so you might have, you know, a brotherly love for certain things, or the eros doesn't have to be sexual. Always, it can be that'd be. I would describe that more of the pizza. You know, I don't eros pizza, but right. you know, but but have that kind of. Uh, attraction towards it, affection for it, and um, but but uh, so that's why I think we have to put these words like you use the word pure love, I uh, use the word radical love. When we use the word radical, it's interesting. Have you noticed this, Joshua? That it's it, it's usually not issues of these more genteel. Uh, we don't talk about radical humility yeah. or radical forgiveness or radical love. It's usually radical power, radical prayer life, radical evangelism. Yes, and, and I like the idea that really the if. Paul is correct, and we know he is. The greatest of these is love. love. Yeah. And so that is the most radical of radical things that you could do and yes. be. And that is the most important thing this generation needs. Uh, parentless upbringings, fatherless children, um, coming, into a, a, you know, coming into a culture that um, Paul told Timothy in the last days, men would be Lovers, lovers of, of themselves, cold, cold, dry, you know, uh, angry, hateful, and so swollen with conceit. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah, and that, that's that's what we're talking about radical love in that kind of culture. So in that kind of culture, we are image bearers of God, called as we talked about in the first episode of this series um, to go out and subdue, to to rule, and that's not a power trip. It's 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 to subdue hatred with love. Right. It's subdue anger with grace. It's, it's subdue. It's 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 the exact opposite of what what we've come using. You know, we're talking about definitions here of love. Perfect love casts yeah. out all fear. Yeah, it's it's it has power. It to, definitely to do does. So, before so, you move on, there's one yeah, thing I no, wanted please. to say. When you talked about the culture um, a little bit, and you said you know people don't have fathers, and people have you know these extreme sort of things that. That, that create that void. I think that's why the world 
has co-opted love as tolerance and acceptance mm. of everything mm-hmm. is because it is sort of a, a you know, a, a getting away from the opposite of that. And so it's like, no, we accept you how you are. Um, and so both things are wrong. Obviously, God is love. And this isn't a perfect definition of love, but I like to say that love isn't doing what's easy or what someone wants you to or or going with someone's feelings. Love is doing what's right, no matter the personal cost to you. Mm-hmm. That we see that in Christ. Love is sad, uh, sacrificial. Um, yeah. You know, love is patient. Love is kind. Quoting, yeah. you know, First Corinthians thirteen. But I think it's this idea that because we have to acknowledge, if we're talking about love, that love is undivorceable from truth. Yeah. And so, you know, love is telling someone the truth and doing it in a loving way. Sometimes love is. Uh, correction. Sometimes love is rebuke. Yeah. Sometimes love is encouragement. But I think love has to, uh, you can have all these sub things that come out of love. But I think it's so important to realize that if you remove truth from love, you no longer have love. Yeah. And that's what tolerance has done, especially when it comes to tolerance of sin. You know, people don't want to hurt people or make people feel rejected. And so the solution is love is acceptance. But you know, I always bear back to my addiction days, but there was a point in my life when when love wasn't giving me my way. Love was telling me no. Mm-hmm. Love was withholding from me. Love was telling me the truth that I needed to hear. Yeah. Um, and it's still the case in my life today. Yeah. People love me, tell me the truth. But I just feel like we have to realize that those two things are the same side mm-hmm. of both, both uh, the different side of the same coin yeah. because God is truth and God is love. Yeah, yeah. The, <clears throat> Jesus demonstrated that quite clearly. He, he could be very um, affirming, in, in his conversation with people, Peter, you know, the man didn't reveal this to you. God did. Yeah. You, you, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. <laughs> and then a few minutes later, he's telling him, Satan, get behind me. Right. And so the truth, the truth is always present to Jesus. Yes. But it's, uh, but I, I don't know that I would see the truth of correction or rebuke being the primary. I think it's the introductory thing. We need to get you off that. Right. Get you out of that kingdom. I'm going to re- and then get you into. But to clarify, it's not though. It's not that that because truth, it, truth can be corrective, but truth can also be affirming. Yeah. Like if we if right. you're encouraging someone in the truth, if I'm telling you the truth of who you are in Christ, if I'm telling you the truth, if any man be in Christ, the yeah. old is gone, the new has come. So truth isn't isn't just this sort of negative side corrective right. thing. Right. It does the work of. You know, it is love, and it does whatever work our heart needs it yeah. to do. Yeah. The, if love is the greatest, then truth, whether it be the form of correction or rebuke or uh, encouragement, uh, there, there, there are subcategories of that, I think. Not to say truth is less important than than love. I mean, because you know, they, they have to be married together. I, I, I don't call that balance. I call it harmony. Like my wife has a piano in the next room over there. And, right. you know, it's beautiful when she hits a note. That is, uh, is harmony, you know, so the A and the C together, uh, A, C, D, and then all of a sudden you got right. a chord. And and that, you know, so putting love and truth, rebuke, correction all together makes this beautiful melody in our hearts. And But I, I would say the category out of all those which things flow is, is the love of God, the radical love of God for us. He loves us so much he's willing to correct us. He's willing to deal with our sin. He's willing to to do these things. And I would agree wholeheartedly with you, Joshua, too, that <clears throat> this you were describing earlier love, kind of almost like being a verb. It's not just something we feel. It's not just an emotion. It's not just a, uh, our heartstrings or so. You know, that, that can be a romantic type of love. More back to the word of Eros. That uh, By the way, C.S. Lewis wrote a great book called, the, well, there you go, Four Loves. Like, yeah. Neither of us can remember what the fourth one is. But, but uh, the, the you know, every, anytime, I just wrote a few scriptures down here. Uh, and, and catch this, this is so powerful. Galatians 2.20, uh, Jesus who loved me and gave himself for me. Ephesians 5, 1, to, to 1 and 2, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. Romans 5, 8, but God shows his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. All of these and probably almost every scripture that refers to Jesus, uh, his kingdom the, that he's bringing to earth, is, is, is he's showing us something. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this for you. It's 
it's it's it's far beyond an emotion because your emotions go up and down. No uh, doubt about it's, it. It's something much more powerful than that. It's not a completely, you know, I don't want to make this like an empirical true statement, but I, I think there's a value to what I'm about to say. You know, that's why many marriages end, end in divorce is because we think of love as a feeling when love is really a commitment or a decision we right. make, like God purposed in his heart to lay down his life for us while we were yet sinners. You know, it wasn't because, you know, it's like, oh, well, Gary's got some potential. No, it's it's this yeah. generous act of love of pouring himself out. And that's why I always like to say in just a really simple way that, you know, God shows his love for this by laying his life down for us. And the best thing we can do is the same thing. Give people Jesus. Yeah. Jesus gave himself for us. We give people Jesus and we do that by laying our life down, by favoring others over ourselves in a plethora of other ways. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. So true. This, to, see, to see that Christ does that for us and then Again, he's that uh, correct, the perfect image bearer of God. That's what God is doing. He's he's spreading this radical love across the earth, and he invites us to engage with him. Uh, you know, it's it's like the war of love, so to speak. It's it's uh, you know the war of the world is possession, overcoming, stepping on the head of the other, climbing up the, the ladder to to your own personal gain and glory. And Christ comes with this countercultural upside down kingdom and he's saying no my my radical love is giving my life away it's it's pouring out on others it's esteeming of philippians 2 esteeming others more highly than my, myself um that that that's the kind of love that i think this generation is looking for and if we're going to see a revival and a spiritual awakening this is going to have to be an element of it that we're that we walk in humility and that we are deeply devoted to the kind of love that jesus demonstrated to us that we have for one another and that's so different than the way the world thinks of it. You know, you talked about that earlier, the, the way the world sets up, you know, tolerance and stuff. And so it has this whole in, intersectionality where, interestingly enough, it's almost like trying to rob the radical love of the, of the church and and um, kind of manipulate it and almost then destroy it. So Because right. yeah. it's it, intersectionality, actually, if you look at the list, it's almost like, okay, if you're a uh, non-white male, okay, so you're a female, then then you, you've you been hurt probably more than the male has. Right. And if you're not white, you've probably been hurt a little bit more than the white man or the white woman has. And if you are have a deformity, if you're have if you in a wheelchair or if you have a, you know, a, you know, a different sexual preference, you have a, and you go down this list, and, and so the most marginalized, most probably wounded person. And what they do then in intersectionality is, okay, that person has the greatest voice. Um, let, let's not only tolerate them, let's affirm them. Let's let's affirm the the most, you know, kind of the, you know, and it gets bizarre into, you know, you know, to, to transgenderism and all that kind of stuff like that, exalting that kind of lifestyle rather than what Jesus comes and says, uh, we, those aren't outcasts. Those aren't people that I reject. Those are people I choose to save and rescue their life and bring them into the glorious kingdom that's radical love yeah and i think that's what this generation needs to hear is how how do we minister in a culture that is is saying okay if you don't tolerate this you're a bigot you're a hypocrite you're you're uh you know uh, you're angry where actually it's the opposite it's the no it's 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 seeing that brokenness of the world and exalting it that's what that that's bigotry you know that's that's hypocrisy that's because because you're not really dealing with truth as you were talking about truth a little bit earlier so i'm kind of getting down a rabbit hole no, here but over, over different areas it's true because it's a hatred or a disdain for power and authority they think but it really is the misuse of those two things because there really is not a representation in the world yeah. other than the creator of the world and yeah. so you know, when you try to find morality, uh, you know, it's you have people that are that are perverting morality on one side of the street, and then you have other people saying that morality is the answer when both things are false because we're not putting at the centerpiece someone who actually has all power, authority, control, and shows us exactly how to administer those things. And we're supposed to model ourselves after that. And so this is, you know, the, what makes Jesus the great leader was because he didn't assert himself. He, you know, he, he you don't have to tell everybody you're the king when you're the king. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that's, it's, it's, it's both sides of that. And really the answer to both, all of that stuff is in the person of Christ. It's in the cross. I, I wrote something down here. Um, and, you know, it's obviously, 
something we've already said, but it says God's kind of love is sacrificial, Mm -hmm. enemy loving, life laying down. This is a radical kind of love that is born out of something that's buried deep beneath the cross. It's cross focused. It's Christ centered. And the re, and, and so for us, that's what it means when in Matthew 16, 24, when it says to deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. It, we're not saying no, you know, we're not self deprecating people. We're denying ourselves so that we can suffer. No, we're saying a thousand no's so we can say one yes. And that has to be the governing principle of our life. And it all starts with the love of God. And we've we've alluded to this several times, but let me just read the scripture. It's an internal love that spills out onto everything we touch. And the more in tune we are with God and the more we're walking in the spirit, the more true that is of us. That's why after it gives this sort of like example of what it means to walk according to the flesh in Galatians 5, where it says the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalry, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and, and these things alike, I warn you as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. What he's saying is, is not that if you've ever engaged in these things, but it's saying this is what this is what the natural man produces. Mm-hmm. So we were talking about earlier, even in the church, division, strife, comparison, yeah. self-favoring. Um, but he says the fruit or the evidence of the Spirit of God is love, joy, peace. So a person who is indwelled by the love of God will, will have joy in their salvation and they'll have joy for it to give. They'll have a peace that passes understanding. And then that person's going to be gentle, kind, faithful, self-controlled, peaceable, all these other things that we're going to talk about mm-hmm. in the weeks to come. And so I think that when we when we center in on the love of God, this is the fountainhead that everything flows out it is, of. Yeah. It's every you want you want self-control? Well, you got to start with the love of God. Yeah. You want to be at peace in your heart? You've got to start with the love of God. You want to be a more gentle, kind, faithful person? And so instead of ta- attacking it with morality, we've got to go back to this self-denying, enemy-loving, life-sacrificing love of God. And obviously that's the gospel. But beyond that, that radical love is is supposed to be the sort of character trait that, that, that makes us stand out like salt and light from this world. And I think that's that's what the that's what young people are hungry to see. They're, they're hungry to see genuine love that's poured out for no other. Like, what's the reason you're doing this? Even today, sometimes some of the things we do out of love, we just have other things connected to them. It's not radical love. Mm-hmm. It's not serving someone who can't pay you back. It's not doing something where there's no possibility of getting credit. And I started preaching, so I'm sorry. Thank you for watching and listening to the Gary Wilkerson podcast. Josh and I really appreciate the opportunity to minister to you. If you've been blessed by this, encouraged in the Lord, I would love for you to prayerfully consider generously giving to help support this ministry. You can go to worldchallenge.org and you'll find a donate button right there on the homepage. God bless. Thanks. There's two types of people, I think, in the world. And I've heard this said before is uh, black, and this is going to sound strange when you first hear, black holes or single cells. Uh, the black hole, I don't really know the science behind it, but it's this vortex, uh, uh, almost like a toilet bowl. It, it, it sucks everything in around it and pulls it down into this drain. And then what it does is it crushes it into nothingness. There's nothing left in there. And so I think a lot of people that I have come across in my life that don't have this kind of radical love of Jesus, other-centeredness, they, they're a black hole. They just, everything is around them. They pull everything, everybody around them. Here's my need. Here's my problem. Serve me. Help me. And it just crushes everybody around them, where the single cell is totally opposite. If you look at the most uh, integral part of a single cell is that it's always reproducing. It's, it's, it's increasing, it's growing, and it's making more of its kind. And that's what you know, that, that to me, that I think that's a tremendous picture of the radical love of Jesus that is transforming a world, Take, taking people that are living in this vortex of black hole life all around them. Their mom is a black hole. Their teachers are a black hole. They're, they themselves are. Their love relationships are two people. Uh, my professor at college said uh, uh, that that the world today is like, uh, you, you know, how ticks, they get, on, they yes. get onto a dog. He said it's like having two ticks and no dog. They're both <laughs> trying to suck the life out of each other, and there's nothing, to, no, there's nothing no there about it. where the cell 
is 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 this thing again? We're talking about from Genesis. Uh, our, our our initial calling from the garden is uh, to reproduce, to multiply, to to spread, to, to to let the garden expand, let the love of God expand, let the grace of God expand, let the and, and you know it, it comes out of this. Uh, but I'm afraid too often um, we live in this black hole community in this black hole world. But, but Jesus is saying, be just. That's big and it's powerful and it destru- it's destructive, <clears throat> and you're this little cell, but I but I want it that way. You're you're the you're this little thing that that's the little yeast that's going to get into that thing and 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 destroy it. It it it, <clears throat> it it destroys black holes. You know it it brings life to where there's death. It brings hope to where there's hopelessness. Where there's people are isolated. One of the great things about love, it, it these single cells multiply and then all of a sudden it's a community. It's, it becomes an organism. It becomes a larger organism. This love, this radical love we're talking about, is really not a, an individual thing. Uh, I bet a lot of the listeners hearing us today are thinking, "Oh, I want to, I want to love a little bit better," you know. Or a lot of Christians have a high level of uh, adoration and glorification and worship of God, but maybe a lower view of, "Well, I don't really have to love mankind, my neighbor, my yeah. wife." quite to the same degree as I love God. But Jesus said, no, these two are one command. Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. You, you can't separate those two. But James says, if you do, you, you know, you're a liar. The truth's not in you if you don't love your brother. And, and so this First John as well, I mean, I, mm-hmm. it, that's, I mean, it really does, I mean, that's staggering when we think about this sort of like intimate, beautiful, worshiping love of God. And you sort of get like, yes, I'm that person. Yeah. And he says the evidence of that is how you're treating your brother. Yeah. I mean, that's that'll that'll open up your eyes it's, and yeah, your heart. That'll humble you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure will. It'll show you what kingdom you're really living in. Yep. Uh, you know, are you living in that black hole of the world community, or are you living in this this the cell life that gives and gives and increases and builds and builds the beauty of God, but builds the 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 love and joy and joy of God that comes comes from Him and and, and from Him alone, yeah. So that's that's the kind of love we're advocating for. That's the kind of love that I believe would be an earmark of a true revival in these days. That to be a repentance of selfishness, a repentance of isolationism, a repentance of uh, going it alone, bootstrapping it. I can make it on my own. This, you know, I did it my way. American dream thing is to say, no, I'm in a community of believers, and we're going to love one another in such a way. Uh, that the world sees, you know, it's it's a uh, they will you know they'll know you by your love for one another, which is kind of an odd scripture. Or you know, it's like okay, if I love Joshua really well, then the world's going to repent and come to Jesus. Right. Probably not. I don't really see it that way. I, I think it's a bigger picture there. When 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 the world sees how the love, the radical love, is li- is li- being lived out in our community and being expressed then to communities outside of our own. That that then the world takes stands up and takes notice. They're they're going to notice love more than our prayer life. They're going to notice love more than than our um, Bible study. They're they're going to. I'm not putting those down. With those are crucially important. Yes. But but you know Paul, First Corinthians 13, which is probably the place we need to go to end right. our, our podcast today. Um, man, he he says you could have all those things. You know, you could preach with tongues of men and angels. You can. Uh, give your body to be burned. You can do, uh, but if you don't have love, if you're not doing those things, which then speaks to it being an issue of the heart, uh, loving somebody from the heart, not just uh, you know external uh, actions. So that yeah, that's pretty much all I have today for about love. What about you? You have a, uh, well, some closing thoughts? Yeah, I think uh, you know you brought up First Corinthians thirteen, but I think oftentimes. You know, we, we have to talk about the church. They'll know us by our love for each other. I think what makes it so unique is, you know, it's not it's not unique for you to love your family. Like right. you love Kelly, you love your boys, you love your daughter. And so it's this idea of that kind of love that that's, we're bound together through Christ. And so there is this internal community of God where we bear each other's burdens. We love each other. We live our lives for each other. We have all things in common, you know, like they did in Acts. But I think the thing that makes it different is is there's always this offering to the enemy, to the person who scorns us, to the person that that mistreats us, to the person 
that is completely opposed to us, that we want them to be part of that family. I think that's what makes it so different. It's not unique for you to love the people in your family, or even if you have this tight knit group of people like, hey, we're going to stick together. But it's this idea that that sort of love, we want it to spill out. We want it to grow. We want it. We want people to come in. And I think it's marked by the idea that we understand that none of us we're, we're born into the family. We we're all adopted into it by the gracious love of God, and that Amen. permeates everything. And I wrote this little thought down. Uh, it may not be super po- profound, but I think sometimes you, you hit on something a second ago. There are people I know who, not doubting them, I'm not being disrespectful to them, but they claim to have this deep communion and relationship with God. You know, they're like, oh, they're they're always drawn off. And listen, I'm a person that will take private prayer time. I need to get alone with God. I, I have that. That's an important part of the Christian life. But there's some some people who sort of like that's the sort of benchmark of who they are. But they almost seem like they don't like anybody. Um, and I think sometimes we all, we we present loving people as this superimposed thing that we do when it really is this internal thing that's evidence that we have communion with God. Like if we really are shut up with God, if we really are walking with God, if we really are in the secret place with God, you know, is it going to produce a less lovely person towards the creation that we're supposedly trying to draw into this great kingdom? Or is it going to produce this sort of sacrificial, weeping, you know, burden bearing, enemy loving kind of love. And I think, I think it's really an example or an example, a sort of test, so to speak, you know, that, that we, what is our, what is our attitude towards each other? And what is our attitude evangelistically? And, and, and I just think, you know, for me personally, I always have to be reminded that I'm not going to be a more loving person by doing more, loving things. I mean, it's good. Do more loving things. But it's not like, hey, man, I haven't been very loving, so I need to do these acts. That's workspace. No, what I need to do is I need to concentrate on Christ and the sacrifice of the gospel. I need to spend time in prayer with God. And in me personally, it's anecdotal, but it's it produces a person that it's not like I want to love you. It's an overflow yeah. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Yeah. I, I heard this. This will be the last thing I say. Me and my wife we're actually in the middle of this parenting class. It's called like shepherding hearts for Jesus. And, um, you know, the beginning of this sort of thing that we're doing this 14 week class, it's really intense. It's very biblical. Um, and, but the, the beginning part has been about our relationship with each other, but he's like, how easily do we excuse ourselves? We're like, we say, Hey, I said that because I was mad at you, or I said that cause I'm tired, or I treated you that way. Cause I had a bad day at work instead of really going to the heart of the matter and saying, I treated you that way because there's a place in my heart where the love of God is not penetrating right now yeah. because I, I may have been tired. It may have let my defenses down, but I said that to you because it's in my heart. Mm -hmm. We excuse ourselves and we do the same thing with, you know, and so I think if we're going to have a radical love that reaches people like the first century church did and and it sparks some sort of move of God, it's going to be, it's going to be the evidence of who we are flowing out of us. Mm -hmm. And and this is the fruit of the spirit. And I, I think for me, that's, that's what the world wants to see. Yeah. They don't want to see the self-promoting guy that has an agenda. They want to see the person that loves because love is flowing out of them because it's flowing from the vine of life. Absolutely. Well, good good stuff. If anybody's asking the question, a lot of people when they hear uh, some challenging issues of life, you know, how, how do we get that kind of you know seeking Christ to where He rubs off on us and we have His His kind of love. Uh, you know, I think you're spot on saying that it's time with him, it's seeking him, and and then there there comes a step of faith too, because to to get to that first place, okay, I'm, I'm going to have radical love. I have to get it from Jesus, so I have to come to Jesus to get it. But that's an intentionality. I have to choose to go to Jesus, and I think yes. love is the next step. Then saying, okay, I have Jesus now, but I'm not demonstrating. I'm not loving people. I'm not I'm not doing good to my wife. I'm not, and and sometimes there is. 
I'm in complete agreement that it comes from Jesus, and yet I'm also saying that sometimes there comes a time where you, you just have to take a step of faith. Uh, I, I remember when I was a kid, my dad told me this story about uh, he, was, he had just started Teen Challenge in Brooklyn, and he said this big, tall football player came, a volunteer from the Midwest, and volunteer Brooklyn Teen Challenge. Uh, I remember his name for some reason, Herman. And my dad said, uh, uh, Herman said, hey, I want to work with drug addicts. And my dad said, well, our greatest need right now is, is to work with children. And Herman said, man, I don't, I don't like children. I don't like the parents. He says, I don't have any love. I don't think I could do that because you know, God hasn't given me a love for children. And he goes, well, why don't you just, you know, just help us out for a little while, and then we'll move you into a different thing. And he's, my dad said, one day he walked by, and Herman was there, and there was about 15 kids. Like, they were, he was, couldn't even see him. He was on the ground. Kids were wrestling him, and he was laughing and playing. And my dad yelled out. He's like, hey, Herman, do you love children? And he goes, I do. You know? And so, <laughs> you know, so, so sometimes it's the act. Uh, you know, he's going to go more back to the James thing, you know, to show me. Uh, this and, and so I think there's this tension between, okay, I, I you know I know all these things are birthed in my intimacy with Christ, but I, you know sometimes when we step out in faith, that intimacy, uh, it's an impetus for that intimacy to help us I, pursue that. I completely that. agree. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, I completely agree. And yeah. I guess the only thing I was saying was we're not. It's it's not works based. Like we're trying to gain yeah. God's love. That that's love right. is that's there correct. for us. Yeah. Yeah. And realistically, that yeah, step that. of faith. There are many times where the love of Christ is bore out in me because I purpose in my mind today that I'm going to show the love of Christ. Yeah. And I get with God in, in the day and I'm, I make a decision that I'm not going to be short with the flight attendant today. Yeah. You know, and I think, but, but, but the exactly. truth of that is, is bore out of, it's not something I'm super, ter- super imposing on myself. It's something that that I'm nurturing with my intimacy with God. And like you said, I'm purposing to live out. Mm. We do have the purpose to live it out. We have the purpose to give. We have the purpose to evangelize. We have the purpose to do all these things. But if but if it's nothing in the well, then yeah. then we're gonna run dry. Uh, absolutely. Good, good good way to say it. So yeah, we hope you get encouraged <clears throat> about walking in this radical love. You could be part of a great revival that God wants to a move of God to pour out on this generation. And you'd be working among a generation of people that are really hungry for somebody to show them this kind of love. And you could be that vessel. Uh, choose today. Uh, to get that place of, that Josh is talking about of intimacy with him and then choose out of that intimacy to have that the, the brotherly love as well. So God bless you. Thanks for being with us today. Look forward to catching some more time with you in the next episode as we continue on our series about uh, the different elements of a move of God in our generation. Ephesians 6.18 says that we should pray at all times in the Spirit with all kinds of prayer and supplication. If you would like someone at World Challenge to pray with you, visit worldchallenge.org forward slash prayer or call us at 1-833-WC-PRAISE. Again, that's 1-833-WC-PRAISE. If you're enjoying the podcast but want to dig deeper, both Gary and Joshua have books that you can buy right now on our online store. Go to worldchallenge.org and click on the store tab at the top of the page. There you'll find books written by David Wilkerson, Gary Wilkerson, Joshua West, and others as well. Check it out today. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. 